organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in the conference and the opportunity to talk about joint work with one of them, uh, Leonardo Maccarini. Okay, so let me start by recalling some facts that I think you all know about contact manifolds. So n in this talk would be, will be always a non-dimensional manifold, orientables, connected, and the contact structure is a maximally non-integrable hyperplane field, which is locally, this is equivalent to being locally defined as the kernel of some one form alpha where alpha satisfies this condition at uh, every point. So let me start, give some examples. So the first is R2 n plus 1 with its standard contact structure, which is defined as the kernel of a one form, it's global in this case defined as the kernel of a one form, alpha standard, which can be written in the standard form, and this will play a role just a little bit, the standard contact form with coordinates x, i, y, i, and z in R2 n plus 1. And a second example that I'll write here because I want to keep it throughout the lecture, is the sphere, odd dimensional sphere, which we'll see inside Cn plus 1 as the uh, unit vectors. And the standard contact structure can be defined geometrically as the complex tangencies to the tangent bundle to the sphere. So one way of saying that is that you take the tangent bundle and you intersect it to y times it. And so you get the contact structure, which are the complex tangencies to the sphere. That's a contact structure. And it's also globally defined by a contact form. And I'd like to write it because it will, always, it will also play a role later. One way of writing it is this. and you restrict it to the tangent bundle of the sphere. OK, so these are two examples. And I'd like now to recall some basic, two basic results in contact geometry. The first one is Darboud theorem. which says that contact structures have no local invariance. Meaning, for one way of also expressing that, is that that example one is a universal local model. So locally, any contact structure is modeled on the neighborhood of the origin, say, in R2 n plus 1. The second basic result is Gray's stability theorem which says that isotopic contact structures are diffeomorphic. So that means, one way of expressing it is that if you have a family of contact structures parameterized by some parameter t, in this, suppose they are all, and t varies in the interval 0, 1, then you get an isotopy, a family of diffeomorphisms of your manifold n, such that
for each T, it gives a, a different morphism between psi T, the contact structure psi T, and psi zero. Okay? So from these two results, we can ask the following question. which is how to distinguish homotopic but non-isotopic contact structures. So homotopic means that you have a family of hyperplane fields on your manifold such that at the end points, you have contact hyperplanes, contact structures. But in the middle, you might not. Just an isotopy of hyperplane fields on your manifold. So this means that they are homotopic, but we'd like to know when such homotopic things are non-isotopic. And the answer for this lecture there are other answers, possible answers, is to use contact homology. So contact homology is an invariant which might, in some situations, distinguish between homotopic but non-isotopic contact structures. Before going into contact homology, just a little bit of contact homology. Let me discuss a little bit. Recall also contact forms in rib vector fields. So suppose you have a contact structure which is co-oriented. What that means is that it's globally defined as the kernel, not just locally defined, but it can be globally defined as the kernel of a one form alpha with alpha satisfying that non-degeneracy condition, which in this case means that it's a volume form on your manifold. Okay? Alpha is the contact form. It's what's called the contact form. And the first remark is that when you have such a situation, then you can consider and that will be important for us, you can consider the contact planes equipped with the restriction of the alpha to the contact planes, and that gives you a symplectic vector bundle, because d alpha, this non-degeneracy condition, says that d alpha is non-degenerate when restricted to the contact planes, and you get a symplectic vector bundle over n, which we will use later on. Now, given a contact form for your contact structure, you can define the rib vector field, which has already appeared in this conference. Which is a vector field associated with that alpha. It depends on the contact form. A vector field in a manifold M, which is defined by the following two conditions. It's in the kernel of the alpha. The alpha is the two-form on a non-dimensional vector space, so it has a one-dimensional kernel. And we normalize it by the condition that alpha evaluated on it is identically one. So associated with the rib vector field, you get the rib flow. which we'll just denote by this, by integrating this rib vector field, which has some properties. The first one is that it preserves the contact form alpha. So in particular, the linearized flow, the derivative of this flow, preserves the contact structure, and d alpha restricts to, restricted to it, and so it's symplectic. The linearized flow gives a symplectic map 
from this vector bundle to itself. And that property will also be used later on. The second point is that this reflow strongly depends on the choice of alpha, the contact form alpha for your contact structure. Recall that if you have a positive function, You can multiply your, your original contact form by this positive function, and then you get another contact form for the same contact structure. And the rib flow of f times alpha is completely different, can be completely different from the rib flow for, for alpha. For example, and let me return here. If you consider the standard contact, contact form on the sphere, its rib flow is the standard S1 action diagonal S1 action. And so, for example, all rib orbits of this flow are closed with minimal period two pi. And so for this standard contact structure, your rib flow has, for example, something it's infinitely many, simple closed rib orbits. Simple here means excluding multiples of the same orbit, so orbits with minimal period. You can, however, consider a slightly different contact form for the same contact structure. where you weight each of these terms by some real number, positive real number, aj, real numbers aj, such that <coughs> they are linearly independent of a q. If you do that, then the rib flow gets The A is entered there. So it becomes, it's still kind of a flow on each coordinate, but with different periods that are rationally, that are independent of a Q. And so to get the closed orbit, the only way you can get the closed orbit is to look at points where all the coordinates except one are zero. And that does close. So what you have in this situation is that you only have N plus one simple closed rib orbits which are given for each j you look at the points where all coordinates except one are zero and there you have these orbits are obviously closes with minimal period t, which is 2 pi times aj now, where aj is that positive, that positive real number. OK, so by changing, by changing the contact form, you completely change the, the rib flow. So the rib flow by itself is certainly not an invariant of the contact structure because it strongly depends on 
the contact form. Contact homology is a contact isotopy invariant I think introduced, originally introduced by Elias Berg and Hofer, which is extracted from the dynamics of the rib flow. So it's a procedure to extract some invariant that is independent of the contact form, something from the rib flow that would be the same regardless of the contact form you use to define it. It uses pseudomorphic curves in its definition. But because of the particular situation that we'll be considering today, those pseudomorphic curves will not appear at all. And so from now on, I will always assume that we have contact manifold with a choice of contact form with the following properties. The first is that I'll assume that the contact manifold is simply connected in its first chain class. Let me call the first chain class of, well, this is not so good. Okay, the first chain class of the contact structure, which is, which is the first chain class of the symplectic vector bundle, is zero. I will also assume, oh, here I forgot, of a, it's not from dynamics of any rib flow, it's from dynamics of a generic rib flow, which I won't explain what it is, but I'll promise that the ones that show up will be generic. So let me just write that I'll assume that the contact form has a rib vector field which is generic, and being generic in particular means that it has finitely many simple closed rib orbits, which, whose number I'll denote by m. So with m non-degenerate, simple closed rib orbits. Gamma 1 through gamma n. I'll also assume that we've chosen capping disks what are called capping disks for these rewards. These are maps from the disk, the two-dimensional disk, to our manifold M, such that their restriction to the boundary of the disk is the orbit. So for each orbit gamma j, I choose a disk spanning it. which I can't because I'm assuming that the manifold is simply connected. I'll also assume that we have symplectic trivializations of this symplectic vector bundle restricted to each of these disks, capping disks, which means that I've chosen diffeomorphisms between the symplectic vector bundle and the trivial vector bundle over the disk, trivial symplectic vector bundle, where this denotes the standard symplectic form on R2n. And I'll also assume that you've picked this is really not so important, but we have some mark points on each other.
Okay? With these ingredients, one can define what's called the degree of a closed reborb. Let's say a closed reborb with gamma. Let me assume that it has period T and mark point P. And we can consider the linearized rib flow along this orbit, starting at the point P, the mark point. So you take the derivative, and we see it using the trivialization as a map from the symplectic vector space R to N with omega standard to itself by using this symplectic trivialization. And it gives me a path in the symplectic group. Associated to such a path, there is a notion of Collins and the index, or the Robin-Solomon extension of the Collins and the index, which is, which I will not say what exactly it is, but we'll see in examples how to compute it. And I'll define the Collins and the index of the orbit to be the Collins and the index of this path, which is an integer, z, and I'll define the degree of the orbit. to be the Conley's and the index of the orbit, this one we define shifted by this number n minus 2, where this n, recall, is relative to the dimension of our contact manifold that in this talk is 2n plus 1. Okay. So this formula for the degree will be important for us. So the theorem. which follows from Elias and Hoffer work on this contact on balls is the following. If you have a situation where the degree of any simple closed rib orbit and all its multiples, L here denotes a multiple of the closed rib orbit, is even Then, the graded vector space that I'll denote by HC for contact homology of NC, this is by definition the graded vector space generated over Q. By all freely, freely generated over Q by all closed rib orbits so this gadget here is a contact isotopy invariant Contact isotopy invariant in this situation means in the following sense. So we are in a restricted situation where we are assuming that all rib orbits, closed rib orbits, have even degree. And so what this means is that, so it precisely means the following, that if you have a family of contact structures, and such that the end point satisfy the conditions of this theorem, meaning that they admit a generic contact form for which all closed rib orbits are even, then 
this graded vector space of one is isomorphic to the graded vector space of the other. Okay, so that will be the invariant that we will use. Well, let me continue that example of the standard sphere and use this generic contact form and generic flow, which is generic, to compute the contact homology of this in that situation, because it will be good later on to compare with other things. So note that in that example continued, the real flow extends from the contact manifold to we can see it as a flow in, the o in Cn plus 1, where the contact manifold lives, right? It's, well, here, the formula is the same. So this makes sense in Cn plus 1 minus 0. And so it has an extended linearization. which is just given on Cn by the diagonal matrix exactly with those entries there. A linear map from Cn plus 1 into Cn plus 1. This fact, this extended linearization can be used to easily compute Because we have a global linearization of the rib flow to easily compute the degree of the closed rib orbits in this situation, which are these ones here and then its multiples. And note that the periods of this are given by these numbers. OK, and how? Let me illustrate that, because it's it, <laughs> important to understand why this is a situation where the degrees are even and why the degrees are even. So let's compute the columns and the index of one of these things. First, we have to assume that, and that I will not explain, that you can use this pass of symplectic matrix to compute the columns and the index. OK? And so for here, we are interested in seeing the path for an orbit like this. We are interested to consider this thing, where t goes from 0 to 2 pi aj times l. So the columns in the index is additive. So I can, I can compute separately each coordinate and add. Okay? In each coordinate, we have to see how many loops that pass does. Okay? And the number of loops is? For the points where the orbit does not close, it's just the integer part, complete loops, it's just the integer part of this number. And so you have a sum for all these things. No, k is the index. And if k is different from the orbit j where you are considering, because those do not close, and so you count the number of complete loops. And because these are rational independent, it means that you do some loops, but then you do something a little bit more. And that means that you have to add one here for each of these situations when you are computing the Maslow index. And then you also have to take care of the coordinate that corresponds to the AJ. And there you have exactly n loops, not n, L. L loops. And so for each loop, it counts 2, so you get plus 2L. So that's the number you get. The important thing here is that everything is even except this 1. OK? So everything is even except it. So you get what you get here is 2 times some even thing. And this 1 appears how many times? Exactly n times. 
because it's one for each term of this sum, so you get plus n. Okay? And note that this n is exactly the number of coordinates where the loop does not close. That's the important thing I'd like you to keep in mind. It's exactly the number of coordinates where the loop does not close. It's also exactly the number of zeros that the points in your coordinate have. And, okay? But now, you have to shift the degree. Recall, it's this number. So it's this number. Shift it by n minus 2. And this is even. And so the result is even. And so you are in the situation where you, uh, you could apply the theorem, and you could compute from the theorem the contact homology which gives something which I will not write. Okay, but the point is that you can very explicitly compute this in this situation. Okay, and the main point of this lecture and of this joint work with Leonardo is that theorem 1 applies not only to the sphere, but applies to any toric contact manifold. And, see? And <coughs> The contact homology for these contact manifolds can be computed as in the previous example. This S is an S in quotation, but essentially it is not much difficult. Okay? So now I will start over my talk. So I think I started five minutes late, so I exactly halfway. Right, Henrik? OK, good. So now I'll give the same talk again, but with the word toric everywhere. OK? So I'll just put the word toric everywhere. So if there was a big enough blackboard, I would just put toric. But no. OK. So let me first start by defining what's a toric contact method. And I have to confess that I'm much more comfortable dealing with sympathetic manifolds than dealing with contact manifolds, although this whole talk is about contact manifolds. But so, <coughs> I'll define toric contact manifolds with the help of sympathetic manifolds, in particular with the help of sympathetic cones. So what's a sympathetic cone? It's a triple M omega X where m omega is a sympathetic manifold and x is a vector field whose flow is conformally sympathetic, is proper and pulls back the sympathetic form at time t to e to the t times omega. OK? So x is what's called the Liouville vector field. It gives, it gives you, its flow gives you kind of the cone direction on your sympathetic menu. So there will be alternative ways of defining this, but I don't have time. So the importance of sympathetic cones is that they are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with co-oriented contact manifolds. It is very easy to see the relation. 
So if you start with a symplectic cone, you can suddenly consider its quotient by the R action given by the flow of xt. Because of this property, it's proper in free, so you can take the quotient. And you can consider on n the hyperplane distribution, which is the projection. And let's say pi is a projection from n to the quotient, which is the projection of the kernel of x contracting with omega. And that is a contact structure. The way to go back here is through what's called symplectization. Which I think all of you are uh, familiar with. Moreover, if you're given a contact form here, the symplectization takes a very explicit form. You can take just the Cartesian product of your contact manifold with R, Consider there the symplectic form, which is a derivative of e to the t times alpha, where alpha is the contact form. And consider the vector d dt, where t is the r coordinate. And that's your cone. And a contact form, essentially, the choice of a contact form amounts to a choice of a splitting of m into n cross r with this property. OK? And so. <coughs> Being much more comfortable with symplectic stuff, <coughs> I'll just talk about cones now, symplectic cones. But behind, you'll know that we are talking about contact structures. OK, so an example, which I think I erased already there. Yeah, OK, so let's write it here. Actually, I think I'm going to come back to this. So let's write it here. Example is that the symplectization of the only example we've analyzed this lecture so far, which is S to n plus 1 with the contact structure, is simply, as you might expect, just Cn minus 1, which Cn plus 1 minus the origin with the standard symplectic form given by in complex coordinates this and also standard Liouville vector field which is just a radial vector field I'm not going to write it down okay now with the help of cones we can define toric contact manifolds first we define what's a toric sympathetic cone and a toric symplectic cone is a symplectic cone of dimension 2n plus 1 with an effective X preserving Hamiltonian action of a torus of half the dimension. Okay? That's what the toric. So it's a toric, it's a symplectic toric manifold where you require that the action commutes with the with the dilation. Okay, such an action is determined by its moment map such an action is determined by the moment map which is a map as usual goes to the dual of the Lie algebra of the torus, 
but here I'm assuming that I've chosen a basis for the torus, so I'll just say that this is Rn plus 1 dual. I'll keep the dual because it will be important. But it's a moment map that encodes the fact that the Tn action preserves x. So that means that it's homogeneous of degree 1 with respect to the Liouville soft. Okay? So in particular, this already means immediately from this property that the image of the moment map is a cone inside Rn plus 1 dual because of this property. Okay? It doesn't contain the origin, but we add artificially the origin, and we say that C is the moment cone of a toric symplectic cone. Okay? And the corresponding contact manifold The mani contact manifold corresponding to this count is called the toric contact manifold. Okay, example. Again, take here in this one, take the standard action of the torus. on Cn plus 1. <coughs> and this action makes this a toric symplectic cone. OK, obviously. And so, something that we probably all knew, but anyway, so in particular, S to n plus 1, because this is the symplectization of S to n plus 1, is a toric contact manifold. As one would expect, since this talk is about toric contact manifolds, and the only example so far that we've dealt with is this one, so hopefully this one would be a toric contact manifold. Okay, the moment count. It's just, in any dimension, it's just a positive octant or quadrant or whatever. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that similarly to compact symplectic toric manifolds, these moment counts completely classify the toric symplectic count. So there is a theorem, a classification theorem, which is due to Baniaga in Molino for a part, and then Boyer Galitschki for another part, and it was completed by Lerman. And it's from Lerman in his notes that I learned about this, which says that each good cone, so not all cones, appear as moment images for toric sympathetic cone. They have some conditions, which I won't specify because they are not important, but the important thing is that they are not important due to, due to time constraints. So <clears throat> each good count determines a unique toric symplectic count. Let me write it like this, where the moment map I note by. And hence, a unique toric contact map. Which shall denote the unique toric contact manifold associated to a good cone, NC, xi C. So I'm getting a bit, bit, bit late. OK, but it's important for us to at least see briefly 
the proof of the existence part of this theorem. Meaning, how from a cone you built a model, an example for the historic sympathetic cone. And that is a symplectic reduction construction. So you write your cone. So you are given a cone. You want to produce a toric symplectic cone. You are given a geometric cone in Rn, and you write it as intersection of the half spaces that are determined by its facets. So and those are determined by normals. And so you can write any cone as intersection at these half spaces, written in this way, where those vectors nu j are integral vectors in Rn plus 1 and should be thought of as being vectors in the Lie algebra of the torus, not in the dual of the Lie algebra. That's why I'm using the star and the no star. Okay? And these geometrically are the interior normals, primitive interior normals, to facets, because I mentioned one faces of the cone. Now we'll make an assumption which is related to the assumptions that we had in the first part of the talk, which is I'll assume that the set of these normals, so D here is denoting the number of facets of your cone, that the sets of this normal, Z generates the lattice. Zn plus 1. Okay? You can extract the basis of the lattice from them. This is equivalent, by the way, to the simply connected condition. Okay. This is equivalent to requiring that the resulting toric sympathetic cone is simply connected. And that we want, and so we'll assume that. So with this thing, then, we can consider the following map. We can consider the torus Td of dimension D. And we consider a map that I'll denote by beta to the torus Tn plus 1, which in terms at the level of the Lie algebra is just you pick the standard vectors, basis vectors of Rd, and you map them, each one of them, to the normal with the same index. Okay? It's a map from, essentially it's a map from Rd to Rn plus 1 that factors to the lattice, so gives you a map of the torus. Okay? This map is subjective because of this condition. And has a kernel, which I'll denote by k, which, because of this, is isomorphic to a torus of dimension, the difference of these dimensions. It is a torus that lives here, inside this TD. OK, so now the symplectic reduction construction is the following. See, this subtorus k, being a subtorus of Td, acts on Cd minus the origin with its standard symplectic form and commuting with the standard Liouville vector field. It's a subtorus of Cd, so it acts there. And it has a moment map that I'll denote nu k goes to the dual of the algebra of the torus. And then your symplectic cone is the symplectic reduction of CD with respect to this action. Okay? So you just look at this moment map, you take the inverse image of 0 at level 0, and you quotient out by K. So that's the symplectic reduction construction that produces from CD, from the standard example of a toric symplectic cone, from the standard example of a toric symplectic cone, by a suitable symplectic reduction determined by the normals to the cone, your toric symplectic cone. Okay, and that's what we need for the rest. Example, let's go again to the only example that we have so far.
Well, this one. So take the cone which is a positive octant. It has n plus 1 facets. Whose normal are the standard basis vector. OK, it's this thing here. And hence, that map beta is the identity, because it's standard basis vectors to standard basis vector. Hence, the kernel is 0. And hence, the toric symplectic count is just the symplectic reduction of Cn plus 1 minus 0 with respect to nothing. So that's Cn plus 1 minus 0. OK, so the only difference for other toric, the only difference relevant here is that in general for toric sympathetic cones, of course, this guy is not 0. And you have to deal with it. That's the only difference. OK, raise the rest. So the point number five is now to discuss a little bit toric contact forms in the real vector fields, red vector fields. I always say read and I gave this talk, no, not this talk, another talk where the red vector fields appear in Strasbourg and Michel then killed me afterwards. <laughs> and with, with due reason. With the, I, so I'm aware of that, okay? So please don't kill me afterwards. I know it's red, but I, I don't know how it's said. But, so I always say read. I'm sorry. On the other hand, nobody says abreu. They always say abreu. <laughs> and I don't mind, OK? That's fine. OK, so, <clears throat> so let me discuss <clears throat> this. So we start with some count. And you produce some toric sympathetic count. Now, for any vector in the Lie algebra of your torus, let me call it u, on the torus acting on the toric sympathetic count, for any vector here, you get the induced vector field given by the action of this vector on your manifold on the toric symplectic count. It will be a symplectic vector field. And moreover, it will commute with the, with the Liouville vector field. So that gives a vector, which shall be noted by the same letter, in the, contact, in the toric contact manifold. OK? So a lemma is that what I'm interested in is which vectors, which of these vectors are um, red vector fields for some contact forms. And the answer is given by a lemma, which you do to Martelli, Sparks, and Yao in a completely different context. I hope in the end, with the final examples, I'll explain this, the context where these guys appear. But it says the following. Any vector of this type that it's in the interior of the dual cone. So you start with a cone, and you can consider the dual cone inside of the algebra of the torus. And any vector that's in the interior of the dual cone determines a toric contact form. Alpha mu for the toric contact manifold associated with the cone with red vector field R mu, this guy. OK? And just a remark, I'm not defining the dual cone, but geometrically, the normals 
to dual count are edges of count, of dual count C star are edges of count C. Okay, so geometrically you can uh, play with it. So if you do the exercise, <coughs> which I want because I don't have time, this cone is self-dual, so the cone of our example is self-dual, so the dual cone to this guy is a cone like this, and so the red vector fields that one can use are vectors inside this guy, so that means that they all have all coordinates positive, and they can do whatever you want with all coordinates positive, and you should think of the example of S2 n plus 1 with that contact form alpha A, where you had n plus 1 A's, and they all had to be positive. That is, the, the interpretation from this point of view is because they had to lie in the dual count, okay? But I have to go on, so now I'm going into the five minutes I have because we started late. Okay, point six. So contact homology of toric contact mean. So the theorem is the following. So suppose you have a toric sympathetic cone has a toric contact manifold. With pi 1, 0, and C1, 0. Let M be the number of edges of the cone C. Let mu be a vector in the interior of the dual cone. Such that all its coordinates are linearly independent of a cube. You can certainly find tons of those vectors because the dual cone is an open cone, as the cone you started with, so you can certainly find tons of them. Then, the contact form given by this lemma associated with any such vector is a generic contact form. on the toric contact manifold with exactly m simple so if you don't count multiples closed rib orbits where closed rib orbits where um, m is the number of edges of your cone Moreover, the degree of these orbits and all its multiples is even. And so you are in the conditions of Tsirumur. And so you can compute the contact homology, which will always be zero for k odd, because you have nothing of a degree, and you have some rank for k. OK. So I wanted to say something about the proof. I will not. The, the main point I'd like to stress is why 
So everything is completely trivial. Maybe the only, the only once you use the construction, that sympathetic reduction construction of this contact manifold, maybe the only thing is why is the degree even? And the degree is even for the same reason as for SN plus 1. When you, what you have is to lift the rib flow from your contact manifold up to CD, where the sympathetic reduction is. You can do that, and there you see that the, the <coughs> for these contact forms, the rib orbits do not close exactly at the points with coordinates 0. And those correspond to the number of facets of a cone that meet at an edge. And the cone in dimension Rn plus 1 has exactly n facets meeting at an edge. So you get the degree is going to be even plus n again, where n is the number of facets meeting at an edge. And then you have a shift of n minus 2, and so the degree is over here. That's it. That's the only thing. Of course, you have to check that you can lift the vector field in an appropriate way. But you can do that. And then <coughs> let me finish to show that you can have some non-trivial applications of this. Okay, so now this is officially over time. But at least let me give some, some examples. <laughs> Different from Sn plus 1, S to n plus 1. So these are taken from the work that I mentioned in the abstract, involve Martelli and Sparks, and also Gauntlet, Gauntlet and Waldrum, who did some work. These are mathematical physicists who did some work on Sasaki Einstein geometry. And they looked for Sasaki Einstein matrix on S2 cross S3. Those were toric, and they produced, they gave us some cones to play with. Okay, and here are the cones that they gave us. So the, I, I'll, I'll only the, write the ones in R3, so corresponding to contact manifolds of dimension 5. This has higher dimensional generalizations that we can analyze, by the way. So it comes with four facets, and hence you can consider they'll have exactly four periodic orbits, one for each edge of the cone. Let me write the normals so that if you want you can play with this thing. So this is the normal to this facet. This is the normal to this facet. This is the normal to this facet. And this is the normal to the back facet. And P, so this is a cone, depends on this parameter P. P is any natural number. One, two, three, four, five, so infinitely many of those. Okay, the contact manifold associated to any of these cones as a manifold is S2 cross S3 with some contact structure that depends on this parameter p. So the manifold is S2 cross S3, simply connected. And moreover, you can compute that C1 is equal to 0 for all these contact structures. And in this context, being simply connected with C1 is equal to 0 means that they are homotopic to each other. Different p's, homotopic ones. But then you can compute the contact homology using the process. And what you get is different depending on p. The rank is 2p if k is equal to 0 and it's something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. That's enough. So it's different for different p's. And so the contact structures are distinct. So you get infinitely many different contact structures on S2 cross S3. Let me mention that Otto van Kort, who is here, has also a different construction of uh, infinitely many contact structures on S2 cross S3 using some connected some construction. But I think that these infinitely many are different from the infinitely many that he constructs because I don't think he has anything in degree 0. And here they appear in degree 0. So S2 cross S3 has tons of contact structures. OK, sorry for going over time. Thank you. Other questions?
Well, I've tried to find, maybe Otto can, can answer that. I don't think there are. I haven't found any. So I think these are not the same, for example, also as, that's one of the reasons they are probably also not the same as the ones there. At least immediately, the brisk one ones are not toric. And on the other hand, they are certainly not equivalent. The ones that you can construct on these manifolds, they are not equivalent to these ones because the contact homology is different. So I think it's a different construct. Yes? If those, those ones are toric manifolds? That's the question? I don't know. I don't know if they are toric or not. No. Actually, we started, um, so kind of the, the, the starting point for us, for our work, was, was these cones by the math physicists. So kind of the, 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 the talk is completely backwards. Actually, in, in my case, time-wise, it's completely backwards. So I only understood the basics of contact homology. It was really completely backwards. <laughs> Maybe one last week or something preparing this talk, did I understand some more things about um, contact homology? But these examples were given to us, God given to us, by this work of the mathematical physicists. And it was a natural question. You have these contact structures on S2 cross S3, which are clearly homotopic because they knew that pi 1 is 0, C1 is 0. So it's a natural question to ask if they are the same or not. And so that's how we started. You, you, the symplectic size is the symplectization, and so contact homology actually counts the boundary map in contact homology counts holomorphic cylinders if you use cylindrical contact homology here. Counts holomorphic cylinders which are asymptotic to the real orbits on one end and on the other end. So here pseudo-holomorphic curves did not appear and holomorphic cylinders did not appear at all because you only have even degree. And these holomorphic cylinders supposedly connect rib orbits whose difference in degree is one. So we only have even degrees, so the, the, the difference of degrees is two, so they disappear. That's why you, you can't compute it, otherwise. But, but yes, so in the, this dictionary, what you're doing is counting holomorphic symbols in the count. Any other question? Yes? They don't because they are, at least they are symplectically fillable. You can blow up in this case and almost all. You can, you see this, you almost see a filling here, right? The contact structure is a level set in this cone and the filling is here, but it's very singular. But in contact geometry, you can blow up this very easily. And then you add some curves, but at least you get some symplectic filling. And I think that's already enough for not having a plastic stick. Not to find, no, I, no, but I, but you get, you, you would get holomorphic curves in the bottom. How could you get the fine? You get holomorphic spheres when you blow up. Yeah. So when you blow up, what you get is something like this. You blow up, so you add here a facet, so you kind of get Thank you, Miguel, again. Thank you.